go. Uh, his background was not science. He's a lawyer, a lawyer by profession. But it amazed me that he's into into intellectual property, into inventions, and so on. And the latest uh, great news is that he has been appointed by the Ministry of uh, Education to set up what is called the National Innovation Hub for all the universities in Malaysia. So he has a very high KPI that is to commercialize all intellectual property in all Malaysian universities. And good luck to you, my friend. Let us see what you have to tell us. Actually, uh, I give a lot of motivation talks. And then whenever I ask people, how are you today? If anybody say, good, I say, that's only one point. But if somebody say, great, I say, maybe five points. But it's said, excellent, maybe six or seven points. But fantastic is 10 point. So how are you today? Fantastic. Awesome. Super. Yeah, they're getting somewhere. They're getting somewhere. <laughs> Just now, as you all know, uh, I am a uh, lawyer by profession. But actually, I'm a science student. I am a lawyer. Uh, because they all told me that lawyer, you get a lot of money. <laughs> so that's why I did it. No, that's a good money. Uh, but regardless of that, one of the one day I came to the law firm and I saw a very beautiful lady sitting down there waiting for me. I said, How can I help you? Well, I want to divorce my husband. I said, Fine. Uh, so, by the way, that's my third husband I'm divorcing. I said, Wow, that's a very interesting. And looking at her so being. I said, you must have a very, very interesting sex life. <laughs> they said, not really. I'm still a virgin. I <laughs> said, well, that's really awkward. You see, my first husband was a professor. He was always lecturing about it, but he never did it. But my second husband is a lawyer, like you. Always talking about it, but never do it either. Oh, never mind. What about your present husband? Oh, he's a politician. He has been promising to do it for a long time. <laughs> Today we just do it. <laughs> you know, every time I wear a jacket with my badge there from the Prime Minister's office, everybody will take cheap shots, you know. Have you really bought the new air jet? Answer is yes, the new jet has been bought. Any other question? <laughs> no, I'm okay. uh, But that, that's a reality. Uh, it's the news of official. I have been in the private practice for years and years, <clears throat> and then one day out of the blue, that is uh, after the last election, a friend of mine, his name is Tan Sri Joseph Kuru, not corrupt, huh? <laughs> he said, Vincent, would you like to help me? I said, well, of course I'd like to help you. So what, what am I supposed to do? Is that, oh, I'm supposed to look after race and religion in the country. Would you like to come and help me to sort out the race and religion issue, the polarization and what have you? I said, fine, I'll come. But the pay is very low. I said, even if you don't give me a single cent salary, I will still come and play with race and religion. Isn't that good? <laughs> so anyway, if you have any complaint about the race and religious issues in the country, talk to me. <laughs> Uh, mm. so, does that as well. <laughs> He's smart and all that. But regardless of all that, we have uh, managed to. Uh, now, uh, it's no longer race and religion, but a lot of other issues. You forget about that. <clears throat> the other issue that I looked after is to talk about how to bring our country forward from a resource based country to one of an innovation driven country. If you look at our neighbors like Singapore, in terms of the Global Innovation Index, they are always rank number two, number five, and Hong Kong will be ranked number five, number seven, and Taiwan as well. Malaysia this year, or rather last year, 2014, was ranked number 34. So not too bad. Previously, it was even worse. But how do we move our country towards the next level? So I was working with all the ministers, and I said, we have to start coming up with a master plan for innovation. So we are now in the midst of drafting the so-called Malaysian Innovation Blueprint. Malaysia loves blueprint. But what can do with the blueprint? Make the scene, huh? So that is where we are going now. We have got MOSTI, 
we have got the aim at the decade department, and we've got the MOE. Uh, so there are a few uh, sectors looking at the innovation in the country. Excuse me. So, what is the rationale? Next month, you'll be hearing a lot about the higher education uh, blueprint. Higher education blueprint. And one of the roadmap there is to promote what we call autonomy for the universities. And autonomy means that you will have to rely on your resources to generate revenue for the universities. For example, your land, you can, land, you can have a land development or rent out your properties and all that. Or alternatively, use your human resources. So what do they have there? If you look at the five research universities, they do have a lot of patterns, a lot of uh, innovations, and a lot of papers have been published. So how do we turn all that into something tangible? So, but we were looking at it, and looking at the map, looking at the, the notes there, we find that a lot of research was not done based on what is the market requirement. So let's say I go to a university and a professor will approach me and say, listen, I've got this steering wheel. Oh, but I want to buy a car. I see another professor will say, listen, I've got this beautiful gearbox. I, I want to buy a car. Another guy said, i got this radiator. I still want to buy a car. But that is a mismatch. The customer wants a car. But professors keep on sending them a view or a steering wheel or anything. No coordination. Number two, many companies have startups. And some of the startups which I visited, they should not be started in the first place. So I go to look at them and say, what is your business plan? Where are you heading for the next three years, five years? Can your company go listing? Do you have the potential? So they have no answer to all that. <coughs> now, another thing is lack of coordination. When I went around the universities, I realized one thing. Everybody is doing parallel research. That means UM will be doing um, graphene research, supercapacitor. Another university just down the road doing exactly the same thing, spending the money, go to Penang, <laughs> same thing. Everywhere is the same thing. We are spending a lot of money been properly coordinated? No. Nobody knows what each other is doing. So there is no focus. And number four, insufficient or slow development. Sometimes they have shown me a product. Listen, I got this beautiful product called laser LED. I said, fine. So what's so good about it? Oh, it can produce 100 times the power of the normal LED. I said, wow, that's very good. You see the same amount of power? Yes. So, can I see it? No, you can't. I said, why? I'm still waiting for money from the government to buy another machine. And after that, I need so more money to buy another machine. I said, where are you going to get your money? He said, I don't know. <laughs> that is not a problem. He said, you don't have to do that. That's why I mentioned outsourcing facilities. They don't really know that there are facilities out there that can turn your innovation into something. And of course, poor promotion, credibility. When I first told the ministers all around me, I said, I am going to make the professors into entrepreneurs. You know what? Minister straight away said, Minister, that's a fairy tale. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, those who are you are professors and uh, are into entrepreneurs. But that is the concept. It is a fairy tale that they can't do it. So then, how do we then move to the next level? I told all the universities that unless you are global, you can have a big impact, don't talk to me. I've got no time. I've got 20 universities to look after. Give me something that can make me say, wow, what the hell? Ah, if anything, I say, oh, run of the mill, I'm not interested. If you don't evoke me something like, I've never seen that before, and I'm going to be a multi-billionaire, uh, that's more interesting to me. So, number one, 
cutting edge technology. So you have to think of disruptive, game changing. And of course, first to market. A lot of them show me things. You know what I always do? Log into Google and say, hey, hang on. People already launched a product like this. They do not know. Yeah? And uh, number two, you have to know your market. Who are your market? Let's say the guy will say, hey, listen, I got this LED. So what, who is your marketing to? I don't know. Uh, maybe market to uh, Tanaga. <laughs> maybe not. I said, maybe Philips, Osram, Itachi. Maybe your market, but not Tanaga National. So you have to know who you are selling to. And it has to be worldwide again. Assuming you have got something that is very, very good. How do you move it on to the next level? Have we got the culture, the sustainability? So that's where we talk about market penetration and all that. And finally, do we have a culture of continuous innovation? And even if you are very, very good in terms of innovation, are you a good manager? Do you know supply chain management? Do you know marketing and promotion? Do you know about outsourcing? Do you know about OEM? If you don't have all those ideas, you are not ready. So uh, when the Ministry of uh, Education said, listen, uh, we like your ideas, so let's see what you can do. So I said, okay, I'll start off with the five research universities, and then we go to all the other universities. Then we are now in the process of all the collaboration with uh, Sirim, AIM, MPOB, NTDC, Mike, Azana, Dreamtech Malaysia, and all that, SND Corp. And of course, I always travel overseas. I just came back from Taiwan. So we tie with uh, quite a number of universities there, and B3 as well, uh, briefly later. And of course, no money. How do you proceed? <laughs> so seed capital is very, very important. Do we have a culture of endowment in Malaysia for research and development yet? So this is all the issues that we have to address. <clears throat> So, okay. whenever we want to do a sales pitch, we even talk about endowments and all that, we have to capture the imagination of whoever wants to talk to us. For example, I said, can we think of something completely outside the box? Just like uh, when uh, Kennedy, <coughs> before uh, he came up with the policy of putting man on the moon in a decade. And then he garnered up all the top brains in the country and then gave them the dream and the vision of putting man on the moon within the decade. And you know what happened? He galvanized a whole scientific community in the States. And the spin-offs is not putting a man on the moon, but in terms of computer science, in terms of communication, in terms of power through solar panel, in terms of so many other technologies that came up of it. So let's say we talk about the first one. When I go to UPM, yeah, you all know UPM, isn't it? Yeah. Anybody from there? So I told the Vice Chancellor, <coughs> I want you to start a project. So what project do you like? Greening Mecca. Ah, Mecca is a desert, desert. How do you green Mecca? I said, that is the right question. How do you green Mecca? Call everybody in here. How do you green Mecca? Oh, you need water. The way you get the water <coughs> from the sea, okay, and then over here to desalinate the water, and then we have to transport the water, and then how? We have to have a, what we call canopy for the soil, we have the right sort of bushes and all that. Say, so, hi, hi, all this technology just put down there, cleaning the desert. Who's going to find you? For some of these, I've been to Riga, I've been to Saudi Arabia. So how much is the budget? Oh, they have unlimited budget. Great! Now we come up with a business plan. And if you want to come up with this business plan, which you can carry over to Saudi Arabia, make sure that you've got the technology in place. Otherwise, they'll kick us out. So they said, fine, we'll do this, do that. But I said, can UPM handle it on your own? Probably not. Can you do it with other universities in the region? Maybe. If you can't do it, who else do you require? Or maybe in US, or maybe Taiwan. I said, fine. We sit down and one by one we address where we lack and we put together a proposal. Second one, reversing global warming. 
Everybody knows that global warming is a big problem in the world. Whoever can reverse global warming is doing the world a service. Isn't it? What is the culprit? CO2. Carbon dioxide. Have you got an idea? So I go to UN in this case. Come, this is the issue. The topic of the day is reversing global warming. Come, everybody give me ideas. And then everybody say, oh, I got this technology, that technology. I said, I want something very interesting. So Professor Wong of UM, the friend of Tanjay Gam, said, I got this plasma buster of CO2. He said, what does it do? It will go through, let's say, it push carbon dioxide through this plasma screen that he has. It turns into oxygen and then carbon molecules. And you capture the carbon molecule in a filter or water. And out comes oxygen. I said, that's great. What next? Oh, that's all I know. Said, okay, engineering team. How to put it in the car? How to put in the lorry? How to put in the factory? How to put in the power plant? So everybody start coming in. Multi-discipline. Is our university good enough, UN? Maybe, maybe not. If not, who else do we need to collaborate with? So the whole thing, go back again. Same thing, project. Instant learning. Uh, another professor, Chin, from UN. Uh, collaborating that, that, oh, I have got laser rain making system. I shine the laser in the sky, rain will come down. <laughs> hey, that's what he did because he is a professor in Montreal and they were what we call doing the healing of the ozone layer by shining all sorts of laser. What he got in return, he got a lot of snow in Montreal. Then they realized that what we were doing is actually creating what we call ionization in the clouds and Condensation and pop come down. So I then I told him, uh, I don't think they have a laser machine, but can you come up with another technique which creates ionization in the cloud? Oh yeah, we can. Then we talked about using plasma again, how to create plasma in the clouds and all that. Uh, then how to put the balloon up there, how to generate electricity. I went to Taiwan, we even threw the whole chart, how it can be done. So I said, fine, international collaboration. I'll be more than happy, you know, if this works, uh, you can do it in China, America, everywhere. It's a global impact. Agriculture without fertilizer. You all know that fertilizer is one of the main problems of modern day. If you go to a place called Punjab in India, <coughs> you just read through it. Punjab is the cancer center of India. Why? Punjab is the wheat growing basket for India. Every day they put in tons and tons and tons of fertilizer. What happens? Goes down into the waters. Bed. And all the people in Punjab, they have wells. They take water up. So they are drinking fertilizer, water. And the woman get breast cancer, ovarian cancer and all that. I said, okay, fine. How do we have wheat or rice without using fertilizer? Can we start thinking of GM? genetic modification. Can we get a P, which is a legume, which has nitrogen fix fixing nodules in the roots? Maybe done. Then we do research. Oh, it's been done already in London of all places. They have obtained, they have already obtained what we call GM wheat with nitrogen fixing nodules. Now they're waiting for the Prime Minister to approve it to be used. Is that fine? We contact them. And do you know what? They are willing to share. The rice, I said, can we do the same thing for rice? He said, why not? Rice is of the grass family, just like wheat. He said, fine. How long did it take you for coming up with the uh, wheat? He said, 20 years. For rice? Maybe one year. Fine, we we'll do that. Same thing with uh, cellulose, the biofuel. Can we turn all the cellulose, all the trees, all the palm oil tree trunk, which you just smash into the ground, and turn it into fuel? Why not? We've got one whole team working on it now direct from cellulose to biofuel, to biodiesel. Fusion energy, our good friend Dansri Gap said, do you know that in Japan, they do not allow fission nuclear power plant anymore because of the Fukushima. But they are spending a lot of money in terms of nuclear fusion research. They're using plasma as a base. So I said, that's very interesting. And uh, we thought of studying it, and then suddenly one company in the States called Lockheed Martin, 
they announced, and that was considered 2014 Innovation of the Year. You know, they say we can come up with a nuclear power plant using fusion the size of a container. I said, well, that's very interesting. And they say that they'll have it in service in five years' time. I said, excellent. We will make our appointment to go to see them. Can we learn from them? Can we even partner with them? If it does, what does it mean? One cubic meter of water has enough hydrogen in there, more than enough latent power that all the reserved oil and gas in the world. Is that good? Uh, do you make an impact on the world? Now, next one. Instant fresh water from the sea. You know that there's a lady called Olivia Lam from Kampa. She has a company for new water in Singapore. And she's doing extremely well doing reverse osmosis, especially in, apart from Singapore, in the Middle East, where she does a lot of desalination of water. Doing extremely well. But one of our team said, listen, I have got this graphene desalinator. It's going to cost a tenth of the cost to clean water compared to Olivier Lam's reverse osmosis system. I said, that's interesting. Show me. So they did all that. I locked internet. Lo and behold, Lockheed Martin has three patterns already on it. I said, what's the difference between yours and the Lockheed Martin? They announced they're selling the same thing this year. Oh, I said, ours is better, this and that. I said, fine. If yours is better, you will be the fourth pattern together with Lockheed Martin. So we also want to go there and see what they are marketing and how we can actually do. But assuming it works, what does it mean? Any water can be turned into fresh water at a fraction of the cost. Any ship, anybody in the coastal area, you do not need expensive water treatment plants. These are some of the big impact. Does it work only in Malaysia? It work all over the world. Anybody who will be affected by water in the future will be affected. Like I said just now, at every deep bump that you see, what if somebody can make it 100 times brighter? Is there an impact at the same price? Of course there will be an impact. Fracking. You all know what happened to the price of oil. It crashed because of shell rock cracking, fracking. So this technology now has produced so much oil in the market. But we used water. So I challenged the team again, even up to England. <coughs> I don't want to use water. <coughs> then you know, see the Nottingham show me. <coughs> we use microwave. I said, fine. They moisture the rock with water, and they use microwave, and boom, not turn into pieces of rock. Then another guy said, listen, I got a better one. Uh, I'm using uh, shock therapy. I said, fine. So we put in depth charges all over the underneath that, they just release shock waves. Mm. Just like the depth charges you see in the movies, where you go and whack all the submarine. Mm. Well, that's interesting. Crack as well. And then the guy said, Oh, I use epoxy system. I inject two types of epoxy, they mingle and they react, and boom, all the rock will be fractured again. I said, Fine, let's turn it into technology that can be used. So that's why. That innovation hub is so very, very important. <clears throat> so like I mentioned just now, we've got all this technology now in Malaysia, uh, not other countries. In other countries, they are our collaborator. We copy, we work together, and we create something new. <clears throat> so I think all this, uh, all from University of Malaya, thanks to our good friend Tan Sui Gao. He created a unit there called High Impact Research Institute. <laughs> He has to call to ask the government for $600 million. And the government gave him the money. And now he created all these things. So let's give him a big clap. <laughs> so anyway, coming back, what is the way forward? The way forward is we need to harness and synergize all the things that we talk about. The brains, the latent innovation for everyone here and in the universities are all waiting to be unleashed. The question is how best we can get it done. So we are talking about uh, Malaysia will benefit, 
of course, the funding government, and then we are not talking about all the uh, tax exempt uh, status for companies that would like to contribute to innovation. So, before I end, I'd like to tell you another story which describes what I'm supposed to do here. Have you all heard of the story called the Magic Soap Stoke? Not S O A P, eh? S O U P. Soup, making soup. So, soto in the leg. So, this uh, soldier, on the way back to this kampong after fighting a long war, everywhere was devastated, people were poor and hungry. And then he just kicked a lot of stone, and then he found a very interesting rock, something like this. What a funny shape, you know? So, he put the pocket. And then he arrived at the nearest village. And then he said, I'm very hungry. I'd like to get something to eat. Bang the door. I'm a returning soldier. I'm very hungry. Can have some food. Sorry, we can't look after ourselves. Knock, knock, next door. Same answer. Sorry, we can't look after ourselves. So, house to house, all we get with him. But he said, I'm still hungry and I want to eat something. So, what he did was he looked around for a big pot of big pot and he put water in light some firewood underneath, and then just bang, 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 bang the gong. A lot of people in the villages all came out to see what's uh, going on. Then he said, come, I want some to bless you all today. I got this magic soap stone. I'm going to put it in the water, and you're all going to have soup so beautiful that you can never dream about it. And everybody was very curious. So he dropped it in, and the water started to boil, stir. Ah, this is fantastic soup. But it will taste better if you got some vegetables. What do you think? So someone said, I got some vegetables at the backyard. Please take it. Put it aside. Stir, stir, stir. They said, wow, oh, it will taste better if you got some potatoes or some rice or some. Oh, I got some rice. I got some potatoes. Come. Stir, stir, stir. Wow, oh, it will taste a little better if you got some meat or some chicken. Oh, I got plenty of meat in the house somewhere. Come. Stir, stir, stir. Wow, oh, now I need something even better. I need salt and seasoning. Oh, I got plenty of that. Okay, the soup is ready. Please, everybody come have a share. So they all started having it. And they all said it was the best soup they ever had. Then they said, okay, we all enjoy and everybody had a good time making a magic soup. So when the soldier had to go back to his own village, he left behind this magic soap stone. And said, whenever you're all hungry and you need to cooperate together, do exactly what I do. Have a big pot, put water in, and create magic. So today's stop is up to here. So how are we going to create magic? So thank you very much. <laughs> I think there's a lot more challenge to getting all the universities together to get their inventions into the market. That's really his biggest task now. The job is half done, but the other half is his job. And if he doesn't make it, I wouldn't claim to be his friend anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, have you got any questions for him? Remember, his facility is made for all the universities in Malaysia. And that's the KPI given by the Ministry of Education for him to... Uh, so this is official version. You want to continue? No, it's okay. Uh, they can all look. Uh, this will be on the website by the MOD. <laughs> and uh, of course, the five universities, then after that, all universities where are the private universities ah. <laughs> as I said, this is the MOE website <laughs> MOE website so, yeah. so these are the, the, the aim and objective of this particular innovation hub Day, the international universities everywhere, and we will go on to maybe turn it into a global innovation hub. So, basically, that uh, is the gist of my talk. Uh, I'm open to questions. Uh, as we say, to turn this into a reality, it is uh, not a very, very easy task. And uh, maybe I just uh, quote you of this guy, JF Kennedy. You all know JF Kennedy when he talked about going to the moon and how to justify going to the moon. <laughs> we chose to go to the moon 
in this decade and do the other things. Not because they're easy, but because they're hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energy and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept. One we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. So thank you very much. Focus in MOE. This is an initiative from MOE. Um, so, the private universities are also part of the scheme for education because they are also regulated under MOE. So, uh, I cannot put the list. MMU is also uh, part of the scheme at the moment. I have not gone to the other universities. I have met the Naga University, so they are keen to collaborate. I hope someday I might be keen to uh, look at what we have and then to leverage on what has already been done and to use all the networking that we have and also maybe they have a lot of beautiful innovations that only need a little bit of tingling with. Like I said just now, a lot of work has to be done to coordinate and to get them up. Somebody mentioned to me, Vincent Beck, were you educated? I said I was educated in a law school called Victoria Law School and my lecturer was trained in Harvard University and the way they taught was using the Socratic method. Socratic method is why and why. It's not the question and answer. It's always question and question, question and question. So that is my background. I never have answers. It doesn't matter which is the right answer, but you need to ask the right question. You must have the right strategy. So just to give you one example of uh, having the right strategy, you all have heard of a company called Xiaomi, isn't it? Yes. 2010, or four years ago, they started out a startup to go into handphone business. And at the time, Motorola was closing, Nokia was having this problem, Ericsson has gone. And if you tell anybody in the West that you should go into handphone business, it was a crazy thing. But they went in. And now they are the second largest in China. Uh, of course, in the world, they are, have some ranking. But what is it that is different from them and Nokia strategy? Everybody can come up with good management policy. Anybody can have good operation. Anybody can have thousands and thousands of scientists. But do you have the right strategy? Without the right strategy, the right market, you are dead. Who created the first video recorder? That has been sold the home. You all don't remember, is it? Mpax. They came up with a Instagram. Not the present Instagram we have. Mpax was a maker of cameras in all the video studio, all the TV studio. So they came up with this machine that can take 15 minutes. And they sold it to all the company boardrooms so that the head honcho can give their so-called <coughs> corporate message to all the branches. We sold in the first year 150,000 units. Then another guy came along, it was Morita, Sony, said, oh, we have a better idea. People like to take TV series, so we are going to have better max. So then they started to sell the better max, taping video, so it only takes 60, 70 minutes. But again, it did not keep up. Another guy came for JVC. Then they said, ah, why only 60 minutes? Huh? Why would the video show? Why don't we look at the cinema, movies? And they did. We actually come on 90 minutes, 120 minutes. And they did not only sell video cassette recorder. They started the whole video rental business. And, I mean, the rest is history. Everybody would go to a video rental. Netflix, for example, to collect the movie to watch. So it changed the culture. 
can he create a new culture? So this is where innovation comes about. Yesterday's technology and tomorrow history. A lot of people get caught. That's why continuous innovation is very, very important. And uh, coming back to AIM, AIM does not focus on university. AIM focuses on innovation thinking. So they have a lot of programs in primary schools teaching children how to think innovation. They have a lot of uh, programs for secondary schools. They have gone into venture capitalism. They have gone into all sorts of things. MOE is very focused. Universities are going to be autonomous. You need to earn money. You have to rely on yourself and use your people. Everywhere I go, I look at the patterns. As I told just you know, just now, the patterns are just selling a steering wheel where the customer really wants a car. Mm. So how do you sell systems rather than product? So I look at people and I look at situations. Like I said, dreaming the desert, throw it at everybody. That's what the innovation hub does. Thinking, contributing, taking the step, and always be daring. That is what I'm saying. So we make a we are different. Uh, I'm from the private sector. I'm not a civil servant, uh, but I work in the government, and I tell them I have my own KPI to them. When I first met the UPU met minister, why Oma? Why setting up this thing? And I need you to give me tax exemptions. That listen, but wow, that's very good. Uh, how how what's your KPI? The government will stop KPI. I said, I give you 100 public listed company from universities in three years. Hey, <laughs> Vincent, there's not even one company that's a public listed company from any university in Malaysia. You're telling me 100. I said, well, you should ask me for KPI, I give you 100. Said, how, how do you do it? I said, well, since we have already achieved, I mean, put up a KPI, then we have to start thinking how do we get it? Get to it to, just to look at one university, like University of Malaya. Mm. Only after three, six months, uh, I have already <coughs> gone through what they have. I committed 35 listed company from one university. It could be more. Uh, but you add, thanks to us, we got again. Just like that, have 35 innovations that are worthy for public listing. So that is the difference between us and A. Yeah, you see, I have to uh, make it clear here that uh, <coughs> many agencies trying to commercialize uh, university papers and so on, but there's none that really has come up well. So this is an attempt at using an individual like him who comes from the private sector. And by the way, he has uh, given his word that whatever he does will be privately funded, not from the government. Mm -hmm. so, so this is another interesting attempt. You know? Mm. And of course, uh, a person like him who, who is not associated to any university will be able to pull together everybody from the other universities. You know? mm. Because sometimes if you are from one institution, there is some cautiousness you know, trying to keep the uh, cooperation and so on. But he has that uh, advantage that he's not from any university. And also, sometimes he can talk like academic, sometimes he can talk like an inventor, and sometimes he talks like politician. <laughs> 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 so, so he has this advantage where he can talk to everybody. And I, I find this to be his greatest strength, you know. Okay. Any more questions? But of course, I must say this is not only meant for the public ministry. This came from the website of the ministry. They have only put in the public ministry. But he's supposed to bring everybody together, public and private. Is that right? Yes, correct. Right. Okay. Next question. Yes, sir. Can I go? How the commonwealth got benefited from this uh, my innovation for still now here in this society? Why not benefited? What benefits did the commonwealth get from this? Uh, oh, will the commonwealth get from yeah. this? As I said <coughs> earlier on, uh, we are looking at a uh, resource based country to be an innovation based country. And the uh, roadmap that I've uh, laid out is 2021, not 2025. 25. 2025 to have Malaysia as considered an innovation country. Uh, innovation country will be like Singapore, they don't have any natural resources. Like Taiwan, they don't have any natural resources. Korea uh, and a few other countries, like even the European countries. 
all based on innovation being the core driver of the economy. I go to Taiwan and I sign joint ventures with them. Like, let's say with E3. Has anybody heard of E3? Uh, you have a Industry Technology Research Institute. They have 25,000 patents inside there. And they got 5,300 over research scientists full time in there. And they are producing, churning out innovations after innovations every day. And people come and say, I want this, then they'll create something. I want that, they create something. I go there with my own wish list. I say, I want to have my handphone, a battery, which I can charge in five minutes. Would you like that? Yeah. That's fine. And I want the handphone to last a whole day. I hate power bank. <laughs> fine. And then I want the handphone to be even shorter lifespan than my battery. So I don't have to buy battery anymore. Said, fine. So I said, fine? Okay, how? Then we go back again, how? How we do what they call plasma polymerization of lithium and all that. All sorts of things we do. Uh, then we come in. I go to Korea. I'm there the Korean. And they said, Mr. I got this Rex seaweed. Rex seaweed, <laughs> red algae. And it's got a very, very interesting fiber. And I said, what's so interesting about this fiber? Well, this fiber very absorbent, 100 times uh, what we call, 1,000 times the surface area of normal algae fiber. So, so then I said, what can be done? So oh, I can use for baby nappies and old folks nappies. So I'm interested, that I'm interested in innovation. I said, tell me more, tell me more. Uh, yeah, we can replace lithium, and we can replace manganese with this, and we make it the battery. Oh, I said, that's something I'm interested to hear. So immediately we zoom in, forget about all the pampers, forget about all the facial masks. I want a green handphone, a green battery, without lithium and without manganese, but only using seaweed. Green. So it can be done. It can. Okay, we focus. Then we have to start focusing how this to be done, how to package it, how to give it the lifespan, how to market it, this and that. So the whole thing tough. I said, where's my team in Malaysia? Yeah. Oh, Malaysia, very good for growing our game. Fine, I'll do that. How many acres we need? 5,000 acres in Sabah. Fine, we'll look for that. So one by one, we have to go back. So it is no longer a situation where I've got this product. Would you like to license for me or buy from me? That's over already. Those days are over. Mm. Now we are talking about using the brain. Now we move on and change the world. That's what the, when you saw the sign, the first slide, changing the world. Do you dare to change the world? I dare to change my world. Who said that you have change the whole world? At least change your own world. It's better than no world. <laughs> <laughs> so at least we have to have that uh, as a culture. Okay, sorry. Would you be the last question? Okay, that you know you have many initiatives like platform ventures, as I'm called and all kinds of uh, fundings and the VCs and all that. But uh, it is true that you know we are moving towards innovation hub and all that. And I can see that many technology transfer offices is mushrooming in many universities, local and public universities. Now, um, the thing is that um, I think it's not because of the technology and the products, but it's the mindset. Now, I think your job is turning researcher into an entrepreneur, or you can say technopreneur. But uh, we have forgotten that uh, I can see that we are you are trying to emulate many universities like for example Stanford. You know they are good in you know creating entrepreneurial and stuff like that. But uh, we have forgotten. We always look at the good things, but mm -hmm. we have forgotten about the bad things. Now I picked a quote uh, by Jim Clark, uh, one of the founder from uh, Netscape, co-founder uh, in fact. Now uh, Netscape collapsed not because of Microsoft. Now Netscape collapsed because of the academy. I mean the the the, the university because uh, it was a situation where. Jim quote that um, it was a very shameful situation that the academia and uh, the, the, the university trying to file a legal suit against uh, the I mean the entrepreneur I mean the, against the alumni so uh, we have forgotten about the we only remember about the good things we try to copy the other other universities are doing but we have forgotten about the bad things no. can, can, I, can I answer that yeah sure has anybody heard of the term called IP means intellectual property Many companies in the States are called IP trolls. 
Some of them control up to 25,000 patterns. We go to university, it's buy, 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 buy. And the modus operandi, or way of making business, is by barrages of lawyers. Lawyers make money for this IP throw. Everything they see that somehow uh, encroaches onto their IP, they will go there and say, I sue you, give me 100 million, 200 million. And that's the joke now in America. When you cross a bridge, be careful that you don't cross the wrong bridge because some people run after you. They're standing on my bridge. Mm. And they say, okay, can I get on the bridge? No, you have already violated my right to the bridge, not being stepped on by anybody. And I'll still sue you. Court cases in America, like what he said just now, has actually retarded innovation. Mm. I'm a lawyer, I'm a corporate lawyer, I'm an IT lawyer. I handle all sorts of cases. But we are talking about here in Malaysia, all the IP troll. I may at the end of the day control with all the universities, maybe even more patterns than E3 of Taiwan, you know? But on the other hand, we have to understand without innovation, where is the development for the country? Like just now, are the universities the really the heartbeat of the nation? Are the universities the brain for the nation? If so, then who is a conductor? Somebody has to do the conducting. I have seen conductors who can manage anybody, uh, all sorts of violinists, bassoonists, whatever. But without the conductor, everybody will be playing their own tune. That is the role of the Malaysian Innovation Hub, to cut you to the right tune and make music together. So thank you very much, and let's hope to make music together.